Okay. So uh, today um, we're going to push forward with more discussion of some key elements of the modeling vocabulary in any logic. You'll recall over the past set of lectures that we've been building up our working vocabulary, as it were, for putting together the basics of any logic models. I, I argued, maybe it's now four lectures ago, that um, <coughs> in contrast to the very contained but conceptually deep vocabulary we use with classic stock and flow models, where the stocks flows, but their interaction is very complex and rich, and we learn to analyze things in terms of these basic components. With an agent-based modeling, we have a much larger vocabulary at issue. This includes a variety of elements that we've now reviewed, include, and then as well some things that we have yet to get to. But for example, there are state charts, there are events, there are elements of messaging, particularly related to transitions in state charts, but more generally for communication. And today, we're going to be seeing additional mechanisms having to do with spatial embedding and mobility. And of course, I should have mentioned networks, which we covered last time, as, as providing yet another form of context. So last time, we talked about one aspect of agent context, one aspect of the kind of worlds in which agents can be situated, and those were with a discrete context with irregular connections, connections between agents that could be uh, quite varied and quite heterogeneous. And we looked at several different classes of networks. Today, we're going to be looking at another type of situation of agents, another, another context in which agents can be situated, and that is 2D landscapes, 2D space that most commonly represents geographical space, but can be extended to represent um, other forms of, 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 of embedding. For example, irregular spaces associated with facilities. Um, today's lecture is going to start with a discussion of spatial embedding, giving a little bit of a reminder of something we've actually seen before in the form of continuous space. In fact, we saw that some last time when we were talking about the relationship between networks on the one hand and network layout algorithms. So the network connectedness, the topology of the network <coughs> on the one hand, so-called network type in any logic, and on the other hand, the layout mechanism, how it was laid out in space, and then by extension, visually. So we talked some about that. We're going to just take a, a brief review of that. And then we're going to talk about a form of space we haven't yet seen, which is discrete space, a situation where we divide up the available area into a set of collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive little cells. Cells that partition or tessellate the space. And agents can live within those cells and potentially hop amongst those cells. And where each cell might represent a little, little patch, as it were, on some surface. So we're going to take a look at a model which makes use of these discrete patches, but also makes use of another thing we haven't really seen and kind of had mixed feelings about mixing it in, but I think it's a fine uh, illustration of it, which is discrete time. Mm -hmm. So thus far we've been talking about things which operate in continuous time. Mm -hmm. Agents get updated, change, say they receive messages, they get infected, they, they recover, they die, they are born at sort of arbitrary times in a continuous time frame. And now we're going to be talking with this, with this model, we're going to show another alternative way of representing it, which is very common within the agent-based modeling area, which is discrete time. And 
this is basically a matter of discrete steps. So these agents, they move in lockstep, <coughs> and they all hop together to the next step at the, at the same time. And they hop together to the next step at the same time. So instead of having this continuous time abstraction, where things can happen as quickly as needed at certain points, say in the middle of an epidemic, and as slowly as needed during you know, the long winter nights of Saskatchewan. Um, things instead uh, go at a very regular fixed pace. Something that's familiar from just dynamics, where, where models are often integrated with fixed time steps. And you can ask, what is the time step for this model? And it sort of just plods forward at that uh, time step by time step. So we're going to be taking a look at this with a model. We'll go into that model in quite some detail because it's, it's a good illustration of, of both these concepts. We're, so we're going to cover this for, first. This is all about spatial embedding. It doesn't yet have anything to do with movement of agents or situating agents, but they're not necessarily moving. Next, we're going to go on to the issue of agent mobility. How do we move these agents around the space? How do we get them to hop from cell to cell or to move continuously from one area of the space to another? So we'll take a look at different, different ways of achieving agent mobility. What we'll actually find is that they interact with these. How you, move, how you move the agents is a reflection of the type of space. Okay. Um, on the one hand, you hop among these grid cells and only one agent can be in a grid cell at a time, one or zero. Um, and in the other case, you could set agents moving and they can cross like ships in the night. If you push them to there's no limit on the density of agents in any one place but they can move in a smooth sort of way according to a velocity in a certain heading. Okay, so this is an aggressive plan for today. And as time allows, I have an additional lecture planned on some, some elements of Java that uh, could be useful. We'll, we'll see uh, how we do time-wise and how questions come up, okay? Okay, so just mention the broad overview of the lecture. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on motivations, but suffice it to say that embedding agents within a, some spatial context, geographic or otherwise, is quite key to the purposes of many models. Sometimes it's, it's key for expressing the essential dynamics for problems. The fact that rabies is requires one animal to bite another and therefore can't be transmitted at a long distance transmitted locally. Or locality of influence. Uh, Sandy Pentland's studies have shown the disproportionate influence people nearby you have within your social network when compared to other people in your social network who are, <coughs> who are physically removed from you. You may think that there are similar closeness of friendships, but those close to you influence your norms more strongly. So, so Spatial proximity has a lot to do with transmission of norms, transmission of attitudes, of information in some cases, although less so these days, um, cues, and also transmission of, of pathogens. Um, representing spatial topology or spatial layout can also give us insight into certain phenomena. So spatial spatial concentration, for example, of uh, of uh, you know environmental chemicals within a, a so environmental uh, adverse chemicals so uh, contaminants within certain regions of space of the prions we saw that in sort of the deer the deer movement model for chronic wasting disease percolation movement uh, sort of uh, down rivers or what have you. And spatial reference modes, cases where models give rise, like that model we started with on our first day of class, I believe it was, which gave rise to those rings of infection spread. Spatial reference modes that complement the kind of uh, temporal reference modes we're used to dealing with in system dynamics. System dynamics, we often think about reference modes over time, oscillations. 
oscillations or, or exponentially uh, divergent behavior um, or damping behavior that leads to something becoming more and more uh, uh, you know, uh, smaller and smaller type of phenomenon. Here we're dealing with special spatial reference modes we may want to capture. Why is it with rabies we see it spreading out in a sort of ring, for example? Um, why is it we see oscillations, etc.? So, and then finally, spatial embedding can permit GIS integration. I didn't have the opportunity to weave that into today's lecture, but maybe I'll make that a separate lecture just on how how any logic can be integrated with GIS. So. Given the GIS systems out there, um, how do you link that into your model? If you want to represent rivers and you want to represent highways and you want to represent uh, streets so that you could reason about people's movement through these landscapes, how would you do that with any logic? And it turns out any logic has some tools to, to allow you to link in with some popular formats, etc. Okay. Um, so. In a, in a topic we're going to come back to, both in this section of the lecture and in the mobility discussion, I wanted to highlight two types of spatial embedding. Again, I'm focusing here on this issue of situating agents within some 2D space. Okay. And we're going to put aside for the moment the issue of that in some models, we may want those agents to move. Because that's not unique to all models which are spatial embedding, it's to some. But we make a distinction for embedding more generally between two types of, of uh, spatial representation. One is a continuous embedding. And here, we've actually seen it before with the model we've built up. We saw it a number of times last time when we were examining the interaction, the interplay between um, network type and spatial location. So those who were here last time, or those who have viewed the video, which I strongly urge those who couldn't be here last time to do, because last, last lecture was quite very important in the broader scheme of the course. Um, could you remind me of two types of network networks or network layouts that um, where there's an interaction between someone's connections on the one hand and their location on the other. Okay, so small world, small world is something which is topologically based. It's a mixture, you recall, of two things. It's a mixture of Poisson random on the one hand and a mixture of ring lattice, ring lattice on the other. Now, we sometimes chose to display those with certain layout algorithms, but there's two types of networks where, where there's uh, an interaction of, of necessity between, in, in any logic between the layout and the, um, and the uh, location of the agents in space. And I'll, I'll give you a hint. The, the very first type of network um, representation which we used so it was a distance-based. Distance so two people are connected if they're within a certain distance of each other, right? But ring lattice too, right? So they're connected to all these neighbors. No, but that was invariant of what their location is in space. That was purely a logical connection. It picked arbitrarily. Mm -hmm. Who you're connected to in your left and right, oh, and then the rest of and and then and then you could render it in different ways. And one of the ways it showed it nicely on the screen, but it that that connection was not dependent upon or contingent upon you being close together. In distance based, it is. Mm -hmm. You're only connected if you're within a certain distance of each other. Okay. Um, and then there was a different type where we had uh, we had a spring mass layout, um, which basically uh, located people together closely in space if they were connected together. That's actually a layout type, but for any sort of network, if they're connected, it will try to lay up, it will try to put them spatially closer together. Those are two types of interaction we saw. But 
In any case, all of these were aspects of continuous space. These, these circles that we were laying out could be overlapped in some cases. They could be arbitrarily close together. Most of the time, we had few of them, and so they, they happened to fall apart, but sometimes you'd see overlaps. Okay, so that's, that's a, good, a, a continuous space. There's no restriction on the density, how many can be near each other, or what have you. The other possibility is this discrete space, where we have these discrete cells, these patches, which are mutually exclusive, and you're in either one patch, or, or a given patch has, has uh, at least has zero or one agents in it, and a given agent's in exactly one patch. Okay. Um, and we'll see there's a whole set of models that fall into this thing. And this is a classic way, um, arguably the, oh, probably the oldest type of agent-based model, going back do to the 50s. Do we the uh, cell size? Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we'll see how you do that. Okay. We'll see how to do that today in spades. Um, so here you divide it into columns and rows and you have only one agent in, the, in a given cell at the same time, and each agent's in exactly one cell. Okay. Um, okay. So, to, to determine this type of spatial embedding, we go to the environment. The environment is going to determine whether it's continuous or discrete mapping. It has a certain visual width and height, and you can also tell it to divide it up into grid, grid size. We'll see where that that gets done, how many grid cells each way. So there's kind of the, the spatial extent, and then there's the question of how finely do you divide that up? Hmm? How finely do you divide it up? What are the size of the patches? What's the spatial granularity or the spatial resolution um, that, that operate? We'll see how that's specified. Okay, those are two different things. You could imagine, just like you could imagine having for a, a classic stock and flow model, a long period of time, a hundred year simulation, but you do it at one year time steps versus one week time steps. Similarly, you could have a large area depicted and very coarse grained. Maybe you have 10 cells each way, or 10, you know, 10, 10 uh, grid, grid uh, marks each way. So divide up the 10 cells along each dimension. Um, or maybe you, you have a, a to a hundred or a thousand along each line. Okay. And then finally, the environment's going to specify the characteristic of the discrete neighborhoods for discrete spaces. So with discrete spaces, there's a question of who's next to whom. Okay. Um, I probably butcher the English language. Uh, I always get confused when whom and who should be used. Um, Sorry? Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I, I rest assured. Um, so, uh, so here we have a, um, a space divided up into cells. And this might be our index <coughs> individual, person we're concerned with. And we're wondering to whom is that um, this, this cell considered adjacent? Is it just to these four, or is it to eight? Okay. These are the two modes supported by any logic. In other words, is it only the cardinal directions, or is it also these intercardinal directions, northeast, southwest, northwest, southeast? So, so that's an important question. Incidentally, it turns out, I, I don't know why any logic hasn't hasn't uh, implemented this yet. Turns out that you can map a space like this um, even more uh, more generally into hexagons. And it turns out hex hexagons tessellate a space more efficiently because you have each cell connected to six neighbors in a very sort of regular way. And uh, turns out that's the, the largest uh, polygon that can be embedded in a plane. But, um, I, I won't. I won't let my nerdiness get the best of me um, right now. Uh, so in any case, they support two types of sort of square embedding, and uh, you can dictate which type you're going to use. Okay, so this is just an overview. I want to. I want to go through this, the continuous environment just so we can get a glimpse of this. So last time, in fact, for the for the past maybe two, maybe 
three lectures. We've talked about having an environment where there's some sort of uh, spatial option selected. I guess it really came to the fore last time. Our focus last time was on networks, but because a few types of networks and, and layout algorithms interact with spatial layout, um, I drew attention to this. So this is a continuous space, and it had a certain width and height here. Okay, so here it's 500 units across and 500 units down. Okay, that that is associated with this, and. You'll notice that there's other types here, but this is a continuous space. You'll also notice that these last two are, are uh, these last two, the columns and rows, are grayed out. They're not enabled. They're disabled from a UI perspective, and we'll see why that is. They're they're only germane to discrete spaces. So here we had a, a continuous space, and this continuous space allowed us to display the locations of these various items. And this is, in fact, a distance-based network of the sort we were working with last time. And we had these components on it by the vagaries of who happened to be close enough to whom to, to collect, to connect. And uh, this was the continuous space. And an agent's location was picked using a uniform distribution um, in, its, in terms of its uh, vertical and horizontal direction. And what you'll notice here is that by the vagaries of spatial statistics, you get some of these individuals very close to one another, sort of clustered, and others are sort of scattered far apart, right? Mm -hmm. um, continuous space, they can be as close as they want. You know, if, uh, if by chance two things landed directly on each other, um, that would be the luck of the draw, and, and there's and there's nothing to uh, you know to to prevent that or what have you. It's infinitesimally unlikely in a continuously a continuous space that they are precisely atop each other. They're probably off by a very small amount, but maybe visually we can't make it up, right? Um, okay, so continuous space. We've seen this before. We saw that last week. Okay. I'm going to talk now about discrete space and discrete time. And we're going to go into this in great detail. Okay? Um, so with discrete environment, we enable it in the same basic way, but we have to provide a little bit more information. And that's the information to which I just alluded, to which I just appealed. So we indicate a, a discrete space here. But what happens is the columns and the rows then get highlighted. Now, again, this is this issue of the distinction between the width and height of the space and the granularity with which you want to describe it into, as breaking it up into pieces. So this is indicating it's 500 by 500 units. And there's 100 rows, 100 rows and 100 columns within that in each direction. Okay? So we have a total of 10,000 grid cells here, 100 by 100. And each of those grid cells is going to be five units. Turns out to be, by default, pixels, unless you zoom in or what have you, um, five pixels sort of across in each direction. So I got that five <coughs> because 100 and 500 is five. Right? Um, so here we have of a uh, set of grids that's 100 by 100, and it happens to be mapped to a space uh, visually that's 500 by 500. Okay, um, and then that in terms of spatial units is 500 by 500. Um, so these are columns and rows that we're going to be dealing with here. Columns and rows because our foremost attention here is going to be on these grid cells. These grid cells are going to be the the logical places in which agents live. It's true they're going to have a continuous location also. Um, they're going to have some, some broader location. But really, it's going to be uh, the questions we're going to focus on are what cell they're in and who else uh, is nearby that cell, for example. Okay. 
Okay, so this is discrete space. You'll notice, incidentally, there's a GIS component there that I'll, I'll talk about separately. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is to load in a sample model in any logic, okay? So um, specifically, it will be this model called the game of life, okay? Um, and what I'm going to do here um, is, is go load this myself, okay? So let me just uh, close this up and I will, I will follow you. Okay, so here, help, example models, and um, I believe it's just down in this list here. Um, sorry, uh, under T? Okay, um, now why isn't this, uh, I think, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a strange, um, strange thing. Sometimes it shows all of them and sometimes not. Okay, um, come on. Uh, okay, um, so miscellaneous. Um, uh, it's, uh, it may be something to do with screen size um, or what have you. Uh, give me a minute here. It's, uh, it's an odd thing. I'm wondering if it's over on the right hand side or what. What's that? It's under miscellaneous? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, quite right. Uh, okay, so game, the game of life. Um, thank you, thank you. Ah, there we are. Okay, good. Okay. So, um, so here we go. So you'll see that the game of life has three major components um, to define it, to specify. Some specifications associated with the cells, which are going to be, each of which is going to be uniquely mapped to a particular grid, grid location in that 100 by 100 grid. Main is going to specify that grid as well as other characteristics. And then we have a simulation to run it. So let's go uh, take a look at how this, this model works. First, just to, just to engage people, what, let's, let's run it first, OK? So I'm going to right click on this. I didn't plan this, but I think it's worth sort of getting a glimpse of its dynamic behavior. So, so let's run this thing. And what we see is a um, set, of, set of cells displayed in a grid. I believe this is indeed a 100 by 100 grid. And those cells are exhibiting some behavior over time. Um, the behavior that they're exhibiting is based on purely local rules that update the state of a given cell every time step, discrete time step, it updates it based upon a deterministic function of the cells to its north, south, east, and west, four sides, okay? Um, and what you'll see is there's some rather articulated behavior here. For example, there's some sort of things going on uh, over here that they're exhibiting continu continual interaction. And uh, you'll, you might notice, depending on the vagaries of the random number seed, et cetera, there are sometimes objects that sort of glide across the screen and other objects that um, are larger scale structures that evolve in kind of a, an oscillatory way. And you already see some oscillations here, these, these little items here. And in fact, um, in the early days of computers here on the <coughs> MIT campus, well, that wasn't early days of computers, early days of mini computers um, in the uh, 70s particularly. Um, there was a massive amount of computing power that went into simulating this game. And it was probably for um, amusement of the research uh, students, uh, the research scientists and graduate students involved. <coughs> but there was some seriousness of intent with respect to it. In fact, these various things that are on the screen have various names that were given to them in the 70s. And people figured out um, that this game actually had uh, significant conceptual implications because it was so-called computationally universal. Out of those, those rules that lie behind this game, which we'll see are very, very simple, you could actually build a computer. And that computer could then be used to simulate anything a normal computer can, can do. 
it's computational and universal. It's, it's a language that can be used to solve arbitrary computer problems. And it's described with just a few basic rules. Let's talk about this, this, um, this setup. Okay, so this was first articulated by a mathematician named John Conway, who was an English mathematician, who was modifying some ideas by uh, known as someone named John von Neumann, who was really one of the key founders of um, computing, the modern types of computing, and, and has uh, the classic computer architecture used to this day, the von Neumann architecture named after him. Um, John von Neumann was interested in sort of theoretical models of computation. How do you describe in a, in a theoretic way what a computer does? Putting aside the issue of whether it's a silicon or gallium arsenide or light-based computer, um, there's something about computation that transcends the, the materials that define it. There's something about computation that can be used, can be played out in any number of different uh, structures or materials. And he was interested in describing it. And he made use of what are known as cellular automata, which are basically a, a mode of description of computation which divides up space into cells and has time jump forward in steps. Okay? And there are rules that govern how the cells in the next time step depend on the cells in the previous time step. So it evolves, and in many cases in a deterministic way. So this game of life reflects this. Uh, von Neumann had a very complex model of computation, and Conway came up with this much simpler model that still captures this computational universality proper. The fact that it can, you can take your most powerful computer in the world, uh, you know, the, the Chinese supercomputer that's the current world leader in terms of, um, in terms of computational power. And anything that computer can do can be simulated in the game of life. It just will be slower. Okay? So, so Conway came up with this very simple but compelling game. And it was inspired in many ways by the life force of cells. So the idea here is that um, uh, a space, <coughs> one of these grid cells, either contains a living element or not. It either has a living cell or there's nothing there. You call it dead, okay, for now. And then there's stylized rules for when a cell gets born and when it dies, okay. Um, these are all deterministic rules. And what you see is that while well, many things become evolve in a in a way that uh, leads to sort of very simple residues, there are some things that are extremely complex that can come from it. Let's talk a little bit more about this. First of all, I want to emphasize up front: there's no mobility in this model. Okay, there's no. Although you may see moving patterns on the screen. Um, here, uh, and you may see what seem to be shapes evolving in sort of a, a some sort of fixed way, like, like say, so-called stoplights. Um, you'll sometimes see, see these structures almost moving in a predefined way across the space in sort of some periodic fashion. There are actually no one cell is moving. A given cell is either alive or dead. Okay? There's nothing, there's no hopping to another place. So it is a it is a situation where there's no mobility applying. Cells are viewed as surrounded by four neighbors exactly, <coughs> north, south, east, west. That's it. They're not connected logically to their neighbors in the diagonal direction. Only to the direct neighbors. Now using the, the analogy with cells, um, what Conway posited for the sake of this game, was sort of a stylized representation where cells need a certain amount of space to live, a certain amount of free space around them. They can't be cut off from blood flow or what have you by other cells entirely. But they need some other cells nearby them to continue to live as well. So they require some neighboring empty space, but also some proximity to nearby cells. Okay? There needs to be enough of a neighborhood around them of other cells that they don't die from isolation, but not so many that they die from crowding. Okay? Um, and an empty cell, 
becomes occupied here if it has an ideal nurturing environment, if it has three cells around it to which it's connected. So if there's an empty cell which is surrounded by three cells that are occupied, that cell itself becomes, it, it gets born, so to speak. A living cell is established there. The colonization occurs to there. And an existing cell dies, but it's too isolated, too few neighbors, too crowded. It's surrounded by, by uh, too many other cells. It has four surrounding cells. Okay, so these are the basic rules of the game of life, and you can actually specify them much more, um, much more succinctly. Okay, so let's open the, the main class. Okay, so double click on main there, and um, you'll see see this canvas comes up, and I'd like you to scroll over to the left. This is a common trick in any logic models that uh, XJTech uses their sample models, and it's a good trick for you to know as well. The trick is to place, so this area here, from the, from the origin down and to the right, is visible. So that's what's being displayed when you run the model. The area to the left of that is not visible when the model is running. So if you have elements that you don't want to show actively while the model is running, things like this environment and, and the, the population there. You don't want to have those things show up. You put them off the, off the screen, okay? Incidentally, you can still get to them for many models. Um, so uh, you can get to them by, by right-clicking and dragging, or probably command-click on Mac and dragging. And you can go see what's there and kind of poke around at it. Whoa. Um, but uh, but generally speaking, it kind of reduces the, the clutter. Okay, so um, we're taking a look. Now I'd like you to take a look at the environment here. How are we going to define this thing? Okay, so take a look at the environment. You'll notice that what's selected here is a discrete 2D space. Okay. Um, <coughs> so we have, in addition to height and width, scale of the environment. We have spatial uh, quantization that has to take place in columns and rows. And indeed, it's, it's uh, the 500 and 100 I had spoken of, of which I had spoken earlier. But there's some other elements uh, defined here as well. And I, I note that this layout type, this is absolutely key. It's easy to miss, but it's key. You notice it says a range. What that means is, does anyone remember Last time we looked, when we were going through the different network types, we tried different layouts, and there were several layouts. Uh, one was, well, give me a, give me an example of a layout we tried. Yeah, spring, spring was one. A ring was another. Good. And yet another was a range. What did a range do? When we chose that as a layout for it was a matrix. It was a it, it mapped it out in a 2D pattern, right? And that's exactly what's going on here. That's why this is arranged in a 2D pattern. I mean, so when we run this thing, we get this logical mapping of the cells onto this 2D grid here, okay? And that's because it says arranged. If we had chosen another layout type, we would have gotten something quite different. Okay, so let me... Let me just follow this here. Um, I mean, you probably don't want to, to do it, but uh, you know, if you wanted to try a random layout. Um, I believe by default, it's going to go to a random layout, hmm. but I could be wrong. But you can then override it, in other words. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you could find it associated with main, right. Um, sorry. So this, this is actually a random layout. And what, what's going on here, OK, that's interesting. I don't, I don't see something obviously, um, obviously different there. So I'd have to figure out um, maybe there's something overridden elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was wondering that, but I saw some behavior that made me think that it was uh, that was what initially crossed my mind, but it, I saw some behavior that made me think it is communicating with neighbors, so I'd have to go back and take a look. 
uh, when I was a youth, I spent a fair bit of time in front of this game. <laughs> 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 Confessions of a, um, I wasn't playing Halo or something. I was <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right, yeah. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, it's it's a, it's more efficient than that. You could you could actually do it in a uh, much faster way. There's sort of uh, I mean it's it's going to be n squared in the sense that if you have you know um, x times y or say uh, n times n in each dimension, it's going to be it's going to be n squared cells to update. But it doesn't have to for each cell look at sort of all other combinations. So it's you know, it depends how you define your n. If n is the number of total cells, yeah. it's it's not n squared. It's, no, it's linear. Okay. Um, if n is you know the number in each dimension, then yeah, yeah. It's, it's n squared. Okay. So um, in any case, uh, layout type is is uh, something that allows it to be on a two D grid. I'd like to further though note that um, in the neighborhood type here, it selects more. Okay, that's the more neighborhood. That's that's the name historically given to the four cardinal directions. So if your behavior depends only on the four cardinal directions, you're said to be in a more neighborhood. In other words, the connectedness of cells, what's considered next to you, only includes north, south, east, and west. So this is a more neighborhood. There's actually several types of neighborhoods. Um, that are defined in the cellular automata, cellular automata literature, um, and uh, this is one of them. Okay. Um, there's another one called Euclidean. That's the other one any logic supports, and that's the eight. Okay. So north, south, east, west, uh, northeast, southwest, etc. Okay. So um, here we're seeing how how whoop, how that element is is built up. Um, Okay, so I'd like you to go now click. So we've been looking at the environment. I'd like you to look at the population. Okay, that also lives in Maine. And if you click on it, what you should see is that it indicates it's a replicated population. It's creating multiple you know, agents that are living within this population. And particularly uh, 10,000. 10,000 is just the 100 by 100 for the number of grid cells. Okay. Um, okay, um, so now I'd like you to go to the cell class, okay? Um, so double click on cell, okay? And uh, you'll know cell here is denoting the, the sort of grid patch, regardless of whether it's live or not. So the, the model is you have this patch, and the patch may contain a live thing or not, okay? So here we have the cell, and uh, what we're going to do is take a look at some properties of it. So I'm going to go through a set of variables located within the cell. So within the cell, what we have is we have a set of variables here. We also have a visual representation, which is in the upper left we'll be getting to. Um, OK, so just to sort of orient ourselves, each cell keeps track of a couple of things. And some of, some of these things are conveniences to speed up computation. Others communicate important information that's used for the rules, where that information is, is collected at one point and used at another. And yet others indicate key aspects of state. So this alive here, I, I think it's a poor, poor name. It should be called is alive by Java conventions, is alive. But here they call it live. And this indicates whether or not the agent is alive. Okay? So it's a Boolean, which means it's true or false. And you'll notice that its initial value is set to random true. Where have we seen this before? Does anyone remember what this did? We actually saw it in the previous one, random true. So we did see it in a state chart context, but what did it do? 
it draws, it flips a coin, a biased coin. Okay, so it's a Bernoulli draw with a probability of yielding. So it either yields true or false, and it yields true with a probability of point 0.1. So it's called random true. Okay, probability of point 0.1 it yields true. <coughs> Otherwise, it returns. False. Yeah. Okay, so here we have a variable called alive, which is determining am I alive or not as a cell. And with a chance 0.1 initially you're alive, otherwise you're dead. So this is what determines, this is what's used to seed those initial cells on the screen. Why some of them are red and some of them are lemon chiffon. <laughs> Um, believe me, I, I left. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't know what it was, but that, that's what it is. Um, um, okay, so so that's that's the live variable. It's an aspect of state. It's the cell state. Now we could have represented that as a state chart. They chose to represent it as a variable. Mm -hmm. It's it's a somewhat arbitrary decision. Um, and you might do it either way. I probably would have preferred state charts just so visually it was very evident, but, uh, uh, but it's, it's a choice. Okay, there's a couple other variables. One is neighbors, okay? Is there, I'm sorry, is there a computational difference in terms of time and, or memory usage using the variable? There, there is some difference in terms of memory usage. It's going to require a modest amount more. I'm guessing maybe 10% more memory if you did it as a state chart. Um, uh, you know, I, I'd be interested in looking at that, but I think it would be a modest amount of additional memory. Um, on, the, on the flip side, if someone were to see it, they'd immediately see visually, okay, you're either alive or dead, and that's the relevant distinction. And so in terms of communication, um, you know, that's where you'd argue the benefit is, and in terms of mi limiting misunderstandings, or you know, for, for a lot of models I build, I have to work with clients, right? I mean, uh, clients who are who are not, you know, not themselves interested in building up these models, not themselves directly interested in in digging through them. But when I discuss it with them and they see a state chart, they have some gut feel for how that works, and that's important. Rather than seeing a, a thing that says boolean. Exhibit that they exhibit uncomfortable reflexes. Um, <laughs> wouldn't there be more calculations then? Because there will be there will. two states and transition. There, th there will be more calculation. And so, you know, probably what you'd have to do is um, you'd either have to transition trigger based on that or you could send a message and there'd, there'd be more overhead. And what you'd really want to do is set the trade off. So, what I probably would do if I were thinking about doing this is do a little spike, what's called a spike prototype. So I do it in one, a little piece of it in one versus the other and sort of check their memory consumption, check their, their relative speed, and then I decide, okay, should I go this direction or should I go that direction before investing in a larger model, okay? Okay, there's another component, which is neighbors. Um, so this is a, does anyone recognize what this is? We actually saw this before in a previous model in the discussion of Java. This is, yeah, it's a reference to an array. And we we've talked about these some before, but the basic deal is we have this thing called neighbors associated with each cell. So let's imagine a certain cell object at runtime. Neighbors is going to refer to some array. And here it's going to have how many elements?
this is a reference to an array that's going to contain these references to these different cells, each of which is going to have this information. So these are all cells, right? Um, cell, 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 cell. So, um, okay. So uh, we're keeping around this information. Turns out that this is a performance issue. They they just wanted to get this once and not have to keep on requesting it from any from the software. Um, so it gets it once at the beginning of the whole model operation running, and then it sort of just keeps that information around and uses it. Okay, so it has a it has a it's a reference to a so-called array type. That's the sort of thing that this neighbors references. Okay, um, so it keeps track of who its neighbors are. It's like having a little phone book which has their neighbors in your, on your property so that you can call them quickly. Okay. So you don't have to look them up in the phone book. Yeah. What's the access? Oh, so, access. Uh, oh okay. After this here? Okay. Um, okay. So um, I, I, I do have some material on this and I'll be presenting separately, but suffice it to say that um, when you declare a, so let me figure out how much to, to say right now. So basically when you define something within, within uh, a model or more broadly in, in any logic, um, you're defining properties of this thing and you're defining behavior methods, okay? Things that do things, accomplish things, they either compute some number or they perform some tasks, okay? Um, now, there's a question of who do you want to be using those things or to know about them? Because after all, I might be storing some information that's for my use, but I don't want anyone else to be sort of prying on it or using it or counting on it because it might change over time, for example. Um, I might have certain things that that perform jobs within me, but I don't want to have to maintain them later if someone else is counting on them. So I would make those things so-called private. So basically these are, so that I'm not, no one else takes them as promises to, to maintain that information for the world in later versions of this thing that I'm building up. So no one else should be counting on these things if they're private. This public says anyone else in the model could could look at this information, can get this information. So anyone else could ask for how many how many items around me are live, okay? And if if I allow the public within the model to access that, it implies a certain responsibility I have to take. It's kind of like um, if uh, you know if if you have uh, information publicly available on a website. You want to be sure that it's maintained with appropriate integrity, with appropriate uh, safeguards, so that no one else can stomp on it, right? Or and no one else can, uh, it, like you don't want. You want to make sure there's no um, erroneous information there, because other people could could, you know, cite it or whatever. So in short, when we build things within programs and models, as an example. We want to be clear about what we're promising. Um, that sounds odd, but this information, for example, is used internally by this cell. It's, it, it, by my book, this should not be public. It should be private. So, so here, if you go look at this thing, um, uh, if you go look at N live around, um, this is, in fact, I have another slide on it here. Um, this is counting the number of neighbors around my cell that are alive at the current time. And I compute this at one point, but I only update it periodically. And um, here, what I would have done is I would have said private, and then basically only this class could deal with this. No one else can kind of go in there and grab that information out. And I, I don't have to worry that any other pieces of code in this model are counting on it. It's only things in cell, okay? And that's, it turns out that that means less worries when I'm thinking about if I get to change this, who will be impacted? Like what areas of the model will be impacted? Yeah. Okay, I, 
I'm going to show you exactly where that's determined in a second. This, uh, so any logic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this private here, it actually doesn't affect how the model runs. It affects what, um, so by changing this, it won't, if, it won't change how the model runs per se. What it will change is what's allowed elsewhere in the model. And it's basically a way of being tidy, okay? And, and I have some uh, separate lecture that will talk about this, okay? Um, it's about when we're building systems, we have to be tidy, because if we're not, we're gonna, we're gonna build as big a mess as, as the world out there. And models should simplify, they shouldn't complicate our lives, okay? And, and when we're building, particularly agent-based models, there's lots of moving parts, and we have to be careful about, about how we build them in it so that we're, we're, we're neat and tidy and we have clear understanding of what's going on because it will lower the risk of mistakes. Um, so this private here uh, currently was public. They didn't really pay attention to it. It really should be private, to be honest. Um, and if you did that and you compile it up here, it'll be fine. Um, so I'm going to do my thing. Okay, so what you are asking, though, is, is sort of operationally, how this says it's going to count the number of neighbors. Where is that determined? Who's computing that? Show me, show me, right? That's what they say in Missouri. Um, it's a show me state. Um, <laughs> you didn't think you'd learn that in this class, did you? Um, well, it is. Um, go look it up. Just like Connecticut is the not state. Um, uh, okay, so so now let's go up and click on that red dot. The upper left. Do you see it? Okay, so can anyone? So go to the dynamic tab. Can anyone interpret for me what's going on here? There's a bit of logic here. What is this logic? I don't want to, anyone want to hazard a guess? What is it? Is that else there? So it's, yeah, so I, I heard some good things here. So it's an if then else. This is what this question mark and colon means. It actually means if alive is true, then the value of fill color is this. Otherwise, it's that. And the value is, so what, is this, what does this mean? Can anyone explain in, in sort of uh, lay terms what this would, what this would say? If the agent's alive, color is red, otherwise it's color of red. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So if, if this cell is alive, make it red. Otherwise make it lemon tree. Um, I, I told you. <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, so it's, it selects the appearance. Okay, now this is where the rubber, ladies and gentlemen, meets the road. Okay, um, what we're going to look at here is under cell, I'd like you to go to the Asian properties. Hmm. Now, what we're going to see here is something that is allowed and supported because we, we have this framework of, of, of discrete time, okay? Um, we're dividing things up into time steps. And, you know, I'm feeling, feeling like I should have done this out, I should have done this in a slightly different order. Um, but suffice it to say that, um, that this model's environment said to use discrete time, to use time steps, okay? to have these steps where the whole model is updated at once. Okay? All the agents are updated at the same time, lockstep. They all stride forward with, with stepping forward at the same time. And so, and so big picture, what's the advantage of that and when might you want to? Okay, so, um, okay, so uh, there are many models that concern themselves with behavior that occurs on defined okay. points, okay? And the, the logic involved is such that you want the updates to all occur in kind of a, a symmetric way, sort of all at those points, okay. all in unison. And, and so rather than dealing with the vagaries of kind of having 
some update early and then others they want to just have it all kind of done done at once now that's a simplifying decision in a model but it does lead to kind of expressing it specifying it is in any logic in a different way than you'd specify a continuous model so if i'm dealing with something that's got discrete, discrete states yeah and i wanted to capture those discrete states this would be my no no okay so um i'd like to distinguish between and, and forgive me i'm just going to to spend um two or three minutes here or maybe five minutes on on distinguishing three types of discrete versus continuous things we have to worry about in agent based modeling. Okay, one issue, um, so when we think about continuous versus discrete, um, we're really talking discrete. Um, we're talking about three different considerations, at least, that often come in here. One is if time whether time is divided up into kind of um, chunks of, in this case, a fixed length that you hop between, right? Um, whether space is divided up into these chunks and whether state is divided up into these chunks, okay? These are actually all independent questions. Um, I, you know, here we happen to be with a model that's both discrete space and discrete time. But you can imagine some of this discrete space and continuous time too. Um, state would be like an aspect of. Let me go just go through sort of, uh, you know, different uh, to emphasize these distinctions. Discrete time would be you have um, you're hopping. Let's say every quarter you update. The, uh, the bank accounts of some simulated companies or something like that, right? Or you have, so you have quarterly reports. Uh, a continuous time thing would be, you know, literally um, things can occur that, yeah, some non, you know, this company's um, merger of this with this other company occurs at, you know, 8.38 a.m. And, and this other one, you know, um, it simulates uh, the the um, marketing to customers all through the day, and, and it's, it's basically as fine-grained as you need it to be, okay? And, and that's what we've been dealing with thus far with events. Events can go off really, really quickly, or they can have go off infrequently, and it will jump from event to event to event. It's not at all a fixed time schedule. It, sometimes it's very fine-grained, sometimes it's coarser-grained, okay? Um, but it's not imposed. Uh, discrete time, we have one imposed time step, okay? Space, uh, so discrete space would be a set of patches um, that, uh, again, are, are collectively exhausted, mutually exclusive. They tessellate, they tile the entire area, and your, your, your location is considered to be associated with one of those patches, and you're not really paying attention to kind of where you are in a, continuous sense on there. What's important is that you're in this room or you're in that room or, or what have you, right? Um, so um, um, Colonel Mustard did it with the with the uh, candlestick in the library or in the ballroom or whatever. Um, so that, that would be discrete space. Continuous space would be, well, you're represented as anywhere and it does matter if I'm further from you, it's not a matter of simply are we in the same room. It's a matter of how many meters am I from you, for example, right? The map x y. Yeah, yeah. So that would be that would typically be, you know, that could be represented in a continuous space framework. On the other hand, you could divide it up into ten ten by ten meter patches that are considered the same for some reason, but um, generally speaking, with outdoor space, you'd be a little bit cautious about doing it, maybe with respect to indoor space, um, where you have rooms, you know, it's, you know, everyone in this room can hear me, I hope, um, uh, and, and that's relevant, and we don't really have to figure out how far I am from you. Um, okay, state, continuous state would be something like, you're simulating there, 
risk perception over time and it's evolving in a kind of gradual way sometimes you know it's decaying over time it's rising quickly at other times classic thing like we'd have in a, in a stock and flow model with uh, with stocks right it's continuous space there's no it, we're not having the categories uh, you know it, it divided into a set of, of uh, discrete categorical um, classifications instead it's evolving in a, in a continuous way and the other thing we could have discrete state where have we seen discrete state with agents before we saw it with yeah susceptible infective recovery that's a discrete state thing. Uh, by contrast I could have continuous state model where it's instead of just saying infected we have the level of free virions within the person level of virus within their body evolving and their immune system responding to it and that's a continuous state thing Okay, so yeah, so with respect to all three of these, you have these distinctions, and what we're talking about right now is something that this this thing here is an aspect of discrete time. But isn't that a question of scale? Like in, in the end, that every continuous is discrete. So. Um, How to answer this without giving a course in computer science. Um, okay, so it is true that our computers are discrete, discrete, uh, simulate things in a discretized fashion. However, for in terms of how we think about these things and, and describe them, for all intents and purposes, the real the numbers in our computer, while they're represented perhaps as 64-bit quantities that are nature discrete. There's only so many of them. Two to the 64 is a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, and, and it allows us, in terms of floating point numbers, for example, the appearance of a continuous variation. Okay? Similarly, we can describe a space as so with such a fine level of, of sort of uh, representation of their locations that you could say that secretly it's still discrete but you know for all for all practical purposes it's a continuous space okay um, and and that simplifies our reasoning about some things okay um, uh, the fact that we can formulate, for example, um, Wustocks and flows in the model, a you know, description of how virions involve, uh, evolve without having to worry about is it exactly this level of variance or that level of variance in the same way we would with a, with a sort of susceptible effective recovered type of, of categorization. So it, it is true that it's a fiction, but it's a useful fiction, and it's a fiction that that affords us simpli greater simplicity in our thinking about it. I'll give you another example. I mean, uh, with discrete space here, you can only have one or zero agents in each grid, grid cell, okay? Th th there's kind of a mutual exclusion thing. With continual space, there actually, in terms of simplification of thinking, there's no such, there's no such distinction. So even though, as these agents pass in the model, you might by chance have two agents that happen to occupy precisely the same, down to the you know, 63rd digit, where the fourth one is just the minus sign, um, 63rd dig binary digit, the same exact X and Y location. We don't have to worry that they exclude each other. We, we, we consider it, you know, in the same, in the same way that we would that we consider Boston, we're not going to be worried about the exact meter of space occupied by each person in Boston. We figure people flow past each other pretty, pretty smoothly. We don't have to consider collisions between people in large quantities. Yeah. Yeah. For, for some models, for crowd control models, you might have to consider that sort of thing. Anyway, I don't know that I've done that justice, but it turns out it's a useful fiction that allows us to simplify our assumptions. And for all intents, for all intents and purposes, for all practical purposes, a lot of things are discrete, are, are continuous. Okay. Um, an, another another thing, by the way, is that when I was a young man, um, you know, we were using 16-bit quantities a lot. Then we went to 32. 
um, and then we went to 64. And, and within your professional lifetime, we may be using 128, uh, 256-bit, and things are going to get more and more precise in their continuous description. To think about them as, as quantized, even though they're in fact represented continuously, is just not going to be helpful because that, that level of precision with which we represent them is constantly evolving. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, okay, so what we are looking at here, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time is an aspect of discrete what? Discrete. Um, uh, so, uh, does the clucking get louder <laughs> when, you, when you when you're off? Um, so, uh, so here we have step, and and step here is time step, not space step. Okay. Um, so we have we have logic here, and this logic is associated with the cell, and this is basically saying how does this cell evolve on these time steps, okay? Um, so there's some logic which is going to occur before the step and some logic on the step. Frankly, ladies and gentlemen, the useful fiction of continuous time is, is, is very attractive, it's very useful. We don't have to worry about this. This is the byproduct this is the dark underbelly. This is the <coughs> dark side of discrete time. We have to have some logic which is done just before the step to collect some information, and then some logic done at the step to update things based on that information we collected earlier. Okay. Um, this is the dark underbelly of, of uh, this sort of reasoning. And this is one of the reasons any logic uses continuous time for a lot of the models. Okay? Um, so we're going to take a look at this. I want to talk conceptually, though, about this. This is a big distinction. And within the agent-based modeling world, you'll find real differences in terms of what platforms support. You'll find differences in terms of what models assume in terms of time, and you'll, you'll find different levels of messiness involved in achieving uh, discrete time. Discrete time is a little bit messier because all these agents have to update at the same time, and they have to deal with potential conflicts between their need to gather information and the ordering of who's updated first. I want to gather my information about what I will do before based on the current time before any of them are updated. And then I want to update all together. Okay. Um, okay. So traditionally we were dealing with continuous time. Messages being sent at arbitrary times, recovery at arbitrary times, agents evolving and being born arbitrary times. So we call this asynchronous. I mean every agent is updated at a different time. They're not waiting for each other. They they could be you know, one could be updated before the other, or vice versa. No two agents are likely to be updated while well, in the middle of the model's operation at exactly the same time. So when you consider the other state of other agents, you just consider you just consider sort of what's the situation right now, and you update my own state. You don't have to worry that the person I'm looking at may be updated at this exact same time as me. Um, which is the worry when we're all updated together. So here, no two agents are, are likely to be updated exactly the same time. So we don't have to worry this thing about two need to look at each other's state before either is updated. Here, with discrete time, the synchronous time, they all change in lockstep. It's occurring in time steps. Boom. Boom. Um, just like that. And here, when you're computing the agent behavior, you're computing, you're, you're seeking to determine how the agent state is going to update within the next time step, you're going to need to know something about the state of the agents around this agent. 
okay? You're going to need to ask about the situation for the surrounding agents. My, if I'm an agent, whether I live or die depends on how many agents are around me that are alive. Right now. And I need to make that decision based on the current state before any of those agents are themselves updated. Right? Hmm? So, just as in system dynamics, in classic stock and flow modeling, you're going to make the changes up in the next interval based on the current values of the flows. And those current values of the flows are determined from the current values of the stocks. You're going to determine essentially conceptually all the values of the flows before updating any of the stocks. And then, once you've determined all the values of the flows, then you can update the stocks all at once. Okay? That's what's really occurring within a stock and flow concept. So, uh, context. So here, I won't go go into this in general. I want to go into the how this is enabled. Basically, to enable the steps in the environment for main, we have to do this. See, it says enable steps there. You see that? Okay, that's associated with the environment. And you'll notice if you check it. If you check it, it's going to update these steps. It's going to update, tell the agents when these steps are occurring. What, what if you didn't enable the specified what you do in the agent? Then it would just ignore it? So in other words, if you did this, but you didn't select the steps, it would just ignore it. I, I, I believe that's the case. Um, I mean, you can do an experiment, but I'm pretty confident that's the case. Another question which I'm not answering is, could you mix together discrete and continuous time, have steps, but also have things between the steps? I think the answer is yes. Although I've never done that. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, this I want to go through the dark underbelly, mm -hmm. the belly of the beast of of discrete time. And here you go. There's two things, and this is a classic pattern, ladies and gentlemen. This was something that I saw 21 years ago with some other code, working with a cellular automata in, in a totally different framework. This is something which transcends any logic. It's something that's, that's the nature of having these requirement of synchronous updating. So just before you update anyone, you collect the information from everyone you need to update. Okay. So for each agent, this is code now for each agent. They're going to execute before anyone updates. It's, it's on the step that people are going to update. So just before this step, each agent is going to compute the number of people around them that are alive. Each cell is going to compute the number of people around them, the number of cells around them that are alive. And that's what this code is going to do right there. And we'll see this in more detail in just a second. And then at the step, they're going to use that information they just collected before anyone else updated. And they're going to use that to change their own state, to change whether they're alive or not. See this alive thing? They're assigning to alive. In other words, they're saying, OK, am I alive or dead based on my previous state and based on the state of people around me? So here we go. On before step.
Yeah, it's also a variable. We're just keeping track of our neighbor, right? That's this thing here. For each of these, we're going to go through and we're going to say, hey, are you alive? We're testing. Is it alive? And if so, we're going to, this plus plus adds one to that. So it's going up. One, two, three, four. And it's going to go through. This, this thing here is just a loop through the neighbor. That's all this is. It's saying for each of the neighbors, call that neighbor A, then consider the first. Call him A. Is he alive? If so, count up one. And if not, just continue on to the next one. Is that next one alive? If so, count up. And it's going to go through a four. Uh, and incidentally, Is that guaranteed? That it's all four? Could it be different than four? Riddle me that. Could it be different than four? Why, why might it be different than four? It's at the edge. Yeah. It's at the edge. It's at the edge. We'd have to go see how that's done in any logic here. I believe that for this particular model, I believe that here the edges are considered to have just fewer neighbors. And so, and, yeah, yeah. So a corner would have only two possible neighbors, right? Okay, um, so this loops through every time we see a neighbor, we increment this count. All this means is that's just, as we call it, syntactic sugar. All that says is n alive around equals n alive around plus one. That's all that means. It's, a, it's an old notation that goes back to the 1970s. No. So, so what this is saying is, um, for each of the neighbors, call each in turn. So, so go through this loop for each one in turn, giving A the name of whichever one is appropriate. So first, we'll go through this for the first one, calling that one A, and then it will go through it for the second one, calling that one A for that one. Go through it for the third one, calling that one A, and then the fourth one. And then it will be done. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so this A is here. Now, um, this, this thing with cell, basically what that's saying is, okay, look, this is an agent here. Um, and we want it to treat as a cell, because we want to ask if it's alive. And not every agent has a, a life in its property. We need to treat it as a, as a cell, one of our types of, of agents. That we've defined in this model. I know that this A is in my neighbors, that they're all cells, so I'm going to treat it like a cell and ask whether it's alive. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so that's our little bit of code to collect the information. The whole job of this is before anyone changes their aliveness status around us, we want to get some, gather all the information we're going to need to determine what we should do. So there's no funny business with halfway through when I'm doing this, somebody else already updated, and I don't know what their state was. All I know is their new state. This allows us, everyone, to kind of look at the situation before. And now, this is the on step. This is, so that was on before step, before anyone updated. This is where people update. And this is the other part of the belly of the beast. I'm gonna unlock the doors. Um, okay, so, okay. Here, this is performing the update based on the observed information. So, we have information we computed in on before step. What was that information that we computed? The job of that on before step, what did it compute? Yeah, how many live neighbors? N alive around. That's the number of ones right around me. In other words, if I'm here, how many around here are alive, right? It's either 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, right? So given that, that we already computed that, and where do we store that information? We stored it within our N alive, right? So it's still around, okay. So given that we have that, now we're going to determine what our liveness is going to be in this next step. Okay? And 
We can do this with abandon. Because we don't have to worry that anyone else is going to be only counting up whether or not we're alive now. Everyone, everyone before this step has done their computation, what they need to know to determine whether they're going to be alive or dead. And now we're going to actually do it. So they've already computed there. Every cell around me has already computed their analyze around as well, right? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So in other words, in on before step, I'm computing how many neighbors around me are alive. This guy is computing how many neighbors around him are alive. This one is how many neighbors around her are alive. How many neighbors around her? How many uh, neighbors around him are alive? They're all doing that in on before step. So they are no longer, if I update myself, it's not going to throw off their calculation. Okay. Um, so now, now we can each, each of them can compute. So they have, so for a given cell, we consider how many neighbors around it are alive. We consider its current liveness status, and on the basis of that, we update it. And the rule here is, is put out in a somewhat complex form here. It's put out in a succinct form. Um, and and uh, I think it could be done a little bit more clearly, but I'll explain it. But the big picture thing is here, this is being assigned to because we're updating whether or not we're alive. That's our only aspect of state. It's updating it based on our current liveness to this point and the state of those around us. That's the big picture. The details of the rule are such as specified here. And a, an alive cell stays alive if and only if it is two or three alive neighbors. If it's one or zero, it's too few. It'll die. If it has four, that's too crowded, it will die. Okay, so if we're currently alive, and, and then, it, well, a dead cell becomes alive if there's exactly three neighbors. So, there's exactly three neighbors we're alive, right? We're going to be alive, whether we're dead or started dead or started alive. So we're, if we have three neighbors, we're going to be alive in any case. And, and actually, so conceptually, this is a logical or. This is saying if either, so this is a true or false thing. We're either alive or we're dead. And if, if we have three neighbors, we're definitely alive. So this or this is true, we're going to be alive. So if we have three neighbors, we're alive. If we don't have three neighbors, well, it's going to be considering this, this condition here. And this is saying, okay, either you have to be greater than or equal to two and less than or equal to three, based on that criteria, or you have to be currently, um, current, uh, excuse me, and you have to be currently alive. So you're not going to, unless this is true, you're not going to be, if you're not alive already, you're not going to become alive. The only way you're going to become alive is this, this, this latter one is true. But if you're currently alive, okay, you're going to stay alive if, if, if you have at least two neighbors and no more than three. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Very terse. You can write this as an if-else. If then else. If, you know, um, you're currently alive, then, you know, if the number of neighbors is, is two or three, then you stay alive, otherwise you die. And if you're dead, you only, you know, you can become alive only if you have three neighbors. Said, you could have said in the, in the, in the bracket, if an alive around is equal to two or three, right? If it's only two or three, it could be 2.5. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. So, so here... This is, this is, again, the uh, ugly underbelly. Ugly because we have to do it in two steps. We have to collect all the information so we don't get thrown off if someone else updates before us, one of our neighbors. And then secondly, we have to do the update. And that's the update. And that is the bad side of discrete talk. We have to actually write that, that little, little bit of code. Okay? Um, and that's why I don't show that, show that earlier. So. This is the big picture, though. On this, we're updating our status based on information we gathered and on before step and our current current status to this point. Okay. So, 
So that's on before step and on step. Um, yeah, yeah, sure.
If we know it's a cell, we can ask for its log. If, if we didn't do that, could, I'll, I'll, and I'll get to you in just a sec. If we didn't do that, let's, let's just go see what happens if we don't do that, okay? So, so let's go over to, to this, and we'll go to cell, okay? Um, let's just go to cell here, okay? And uh, we will go to an agent, okay? The properties of cell, we go to the agent thing here. Let's suppose we got rid of that, okay? Uh, don't do this at home, but l let, me just, let me just do this, okay? I'm gonna do it in front of you. Um, so I'm going to just say a dot alive, right? You might think that's fine. I mean, after all, each of these neighbors, I know it's a cell, right? I know this is a cell, so what shouldn't I just gonna say, so get cell one, get, and call it A, and then I'll ask if it's a lot. And if so, I'll do this thing, right? Um, and uh, ask cell two, ask if it's a lot. is that it will object. Watch this. See, it says alive cannot be resolved or is not a field. Now, um, this is something where it's basically saying, I don't know what alive is. It is. But it doesn't know, maybe this is a... Uh, See, this is what I'm saying about its limits. Um, it doesn't know, it's not smart enough to realize this is a model which only has one type of agent in it. Because after all, maybe you're, for all it knows, given its limited reasoning about it, maybe you have a cell, you have a car. What, what if I needed to use a cell and a car and I wanted to have neighbors and I wanted to rely on all the sales like on the cars? Sure. So, so um, I use the overarching kind of class? Yes, you can. Um, but then it would be quite reasonable to say you can't necessarily assume that your neighbor has an alive status. That alive status is something that's associated with a cell. Maybe it wouldn't be associated with your car. What if I had you in the car? And, and yeah, exactly. Like, look, I think you'd understand that better. Like, if I went to add another agent to the model, it's called car. Yeah, and, and, and that also has status alive. Uh, well, let's suppose it didn't have status alive. What if it did? Okay, what if it did? And they wanted to use it. Yes, okay, so what you're saying is that it should be smart enough, and yeah. what I'm telling you is it ain't smart enough. And how would I do that? So that would I say N? Um, you, what you would do is, okay, so if you're saying how would you get it to do it either way, okay. Um, so, so there's a couple ways to do it. Um, uh, without, without wanting to go into too much detail, um, yes, you could use... You could make them both subtypes of a common class, which would be sort of a living thing class or something like that. And um, that would be a cleaner way to do it. Another way you could do it is you could e have each of them have a, m yes, uh, you could each, you could have a common subclass or a common superclass that has a method named is alive and you call that method so you don't go directly into them. But, but that's outside the scope of this lecture. So I, I don't, I, forgive me if I've thrown people way off, but there's a thing called superclass we'll be getting to. An agent is in fact a superclass of cell. I'll just give a brief hint of this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, people and, uh, people are mammals. Mammals are animals. Animals are a type of, of uh, living, living creature, uh, or living, living uh, uh, quantity, I don't know what to call it, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, living organism. Um, and, and you could imagine within your model wanting to capture multiple types of animals, for example, and you want certain properties to be held for any animal in your model. You want it to have a certain uh, uh, feeding habits and it has, you know, what is an impulse to drink water and an impulse to eat or something like that. Maybe, maybe more closer to home, maybe you, have, maybe you have a person class in your model and then you have males and females. And males and females each have unique uh, characteristics, but then there's a lot in common, right? 
So in common, there might be things like, uh, uh, you know, are they, uh, are, what's their age? Uh, what's their ethnicity? What's their uh, uh, occupational status? What's their income? Those would be common to males and females. And if you define males and females as classes within your model, you don't necessarily want to sort of redefine all those things. You might want to have a person class that captures the common characteristics and then have males and females as kind of specializations of that, of that common class, where, where you know, females would have things associated with uh, childbearing, pregnancy, uh, and uh, males might have uh, you know, uh, bizarre behavior under certain circumstances or whatever, you know, um, want to go watch cars drive around the circle or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, you might, basically you could, you could have specializations of, of this common theme, uh, but you could define that common theme. And we'll see how this can be done in any level, okay? So we'll see how there can be a, a, a common thing that captures the common characteristics, and then you can have different variations of it within your model and avoid having to duplicate a lot of that logic. Okay, yes, but you've yeah, been waiting for a yeah, long time. Yeah, just a quick question. So suppose in another model I had a uh, car, a car, a uh, car class. Car class, yeah. Can I just copy and paste that into this, or is it not that? Yes, you can. Yeah, you can, you can just, uh, but, but more than that, you can actually, you can in some places uh, package them up in a way that instead of just cutting and pasting, the problem with cutting and pasting is that if you cut and paste a bug, it has to go, you have to go fix it at many places. Yeah. Problem is also if you have to evolve it, like you have a clever idea of how to evolve it, you have to evolve it at several places. Yeah. So instead you might want to package it up so there's only one definition of it and just multiple things can use it, okay. right? And um, that can be a desirable thing and it's, it's possible to do that sort of thing, um, uh, to do that to some approximation. I can, I can talk with you separately. Okay, so this is the problem, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't know that an agent is alive because it doesn't know what agents are out there. It doesn't know that five years from now I'm going to define a platypus agent, or I'm going to define a, you know, and I'm going to have a is claw shark, you know, variable, or it doesn't know that I'm going to define a Martian agent or whatever, right? Um, it doesn't know what agents are out there, and it's not smart enough to look at your thing and say, oh, you have a cell that has a lot. So instead, it just says, I don't know, agents in general don't have aliveness property. I don't know what to do. So to treat this as a cell, I have to go like this. I have to put this, these little parentheses. This is called a cast, and it's saying, treat this reference as if it's a reference to a cell. And it is. I know it's a reference to a cell. And if I do that, then it says build completed successfully. It's fine. You notice, by the way, I press this thing up here, which is a build model. That automatically gets done in running the model, but sometimes you just want to use it because you don't want to run the model immediately. Okay, so this is saying it shows ones and zeros. Okay. Um, th this one is build all. Like if I have multiple projects here, it builds them all simultaneously. Okay. Sorry. If I. Okay. Um, okay. So, so let's continue on. Um, so, uh, okay, so we're, we're just going down um, these list of variables. Let's click on neighbor. You remember where we defined neighbors before. Neighbors was, what was neighbors? It was a what? It was an agent array. It was an array of agents. By the way, we could have treated it as an array of cells, and then we wouldn't have to do that cast if we um, uh, okay, but here what we're doing is for this this um, startup code, basically for the cell, when a cell comes into existence, what it does is it grabs its list of neighbors and saves it away. So when a cell comes into existence, it takes its neighbors, calls this get neighbor, that's just built into any logic, get neighbors, and, and it it stores it away because it won't change over time as it says. It just stores it away for future reference. So it doesn't have to call this every time. So that's a performance um, performance thing. So then you run the model and this is this is what it gives. Um, so that's 
that's the code which is running behind the scenes. This is the core of it. This determines whether the cell next time step is alive based on its value, its current time step, and how many things are around it. Yes, you could. Yeah, you could. Um, but it would it wouldn't yield the same results exactly. This oh, one thing I should emphasize about this, this is deterministic. There's no stochastics here at all, right? No stochastics. If you didn't continuous time, you'd have to be asking, okay, well, what leads one cell to update before another cell? Is that stochastic? Is it possible I could update twice in the same period of time where one of my neighbors doesn't update at all? And then there'd be stochastics introduced. And um, one of the beauties of this current thing is that it is totally deterministic, okay? So um, maybe what we'll do is we'll break for, can we keep it to five minutes? And then we'll talk about mobility. Because all we've been talking about right now is embedding. Now I want to talk about mobility. How do these agents move around? How do they carry themselves between cells, okay? And we'll see that in just a minute here, okay? So maybe we can come back in, in five minutes or so, and uh, we'll, we'll go on to that.